Let's try that again. Hello, humans. Sorry, I forgot to put the sound on. Um, so hi. <laughs> There's an Adam in the background. Oh, wait, didn't point the right direction. Um, we're both working from home today because I'm coughing and I don't want to infect the world. Um, even though I don't actually think, I think it's just a cough. But, whatevs. Um, so, The Scarlet Pimpernel. I have never read this book. This is it. Um, I've never read this book before, and I have no idea what it's going to be like. I have a suspicion it's going to have a lot of French words in it, so I'm going to warn you now that I do not speak French, and my pronunciation is bound to be completely horrible. Uh, deal with it, basically. Um, if it was Spanish, I'd probably do better. But I'm pretty sure this book is set in France. So, I may be wrong, of course. Yeah, I mean, chapter one is called Paris, September 1792. So we're going to go with France. Um, yeah. Should we just dive right in, eh? I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Let's give it a go. Here we go. Chapter one, Paris, September. 1792. A surging, seething, murmuring crowd of beings that are human only in name, for to the eye and ear they seem naught but savage creatures, animated by vile passions and by the lust of vengeance and of hate. The hour, some little time before sunset, and the place, the West Barricade, at the very spot where, a decade later, a proud tyrant raised an undying monument to the nation's glory and his own Vanity. Hey, Artbeck, welcome back. This is going to be a delight to read. During the greater part of the day, the guillotine had been kept busy at its ghastly work. All that France had boasted of in the past centuries, of ancient names and blue blood, had paid toll to her desire for liberty and for fraternity. The carnage had only ceased at this late hour of the day, because there were other more interesting sights for the people to witness, a little while before the final closing of the barricades for the night. And so the crowd rushed away from the Place de la Grive and made for the various barricades in order to watch this interesting and amusing sight. It was to be seen every day, for those aristos were such fools. They were traitors to the people, of course, all of them, men, women, and children who happened to be descendants of the great men who since the Crusades had made the glory of France, her old noblesse. Their ancestors had oppressed the people, had crushed them under the scarlet heels of their dainty buckled shoes, and now the people had become the rulers of France and crushed their former masters, not beneath their heels, for they went shoeless mostly in those days, but beneath a more effectual weight, the knife of the guillotine. And daily, hourly, the hideous instrument of torture claimed its many victims, old men, young women, tiny children, even until the day when it would finally demand the head of a king and of a beautiful young queen. But this was as it should be. Were not the people now the rulers of France. Every aristocrat was a traitor, as his ancestors had been before him. For two hundred years now the people had sweated and toiled and starved to keep a lustful court in lavish extravagance. Now the descendants of those who had helped to make those courts brilliant had to hide for their lives, to fly if they wished to avoid the tardy vengeance of the people. And they did try to hide, and tried to fly. That was just the fun of the whole thing. Every afternoon before the gates closed and the market carts went out in procession by the various barricades, some fool of an aristo endeavoured to evade the clutches of the Committee of Public Safety. In various disguises, under various pretexts, they tried to slip through the barriers which were so well guarded by citizen soldiers of the Republic. Men in women's clothes, women in male attire, children disguised in beggar's rags. There were some of all sorts, ci devant counts, marquises, even dukes who wanted to fly from France, reach England or some other equally accursed country, and there try to rouse foreign feeling against the glorious revolution, or to raise an army in order to liberate the wretched prisoners in the temple who had once called themselves sovereigns of France. But they were nearly always caught at the barricades. Sergeant Bibot, especially at the West Gate, had a wonderful nose for scenting an aristo in the most perfect disguise. Then, of course, the fun began. Bibot would look at his prey as a cat looks upon a mouse, play with him sometimes for quite a quarter of an hour, 
pretend to be hoodwinked by the disguise, by the wigs and other bits of theatrical makeup which hid the identity of a seat about noble marquis or count. Are you mocking my friend's pronunciation? Look, deal with the fact that I can't speak French, okay? Just accept it and move on. Uh, oh, Bibo had a keen sense of humor, and it was well worth hanging around that West Barricade in order to see him catch an Aristo in the very act of trying to flee from the vengeance of the people. Sometimes Bibo would let his prey actually out by the gates, allowing him to think for the space of two minutes at least that he really had escaped out of Paris, and might even manage to reach the coast of England in safety. But Bibo would let the unfortunate wretch walk about ten meters towards the open country, then he would send two men after him and bring him back, stripped of his disguise. Oh, that was extremely funny, for as often as not the fugitive would prove to be a woman, some proud marchioness, who looked terribly comical when she found herself in Bibo's clutches after all, and knew that a summary trial would wait for her the next day, and after that the fond embrace of Madame la Guillotine. No wonder that on this fine afternoon in September, the crowd around Bibo's gate was eager and excited, the lust of blood grows with its satisfaction. There is no satiety. The crowd had seen a hundred noble heads fall beneath the guillotine today. It wanted to make sure that it would see another hundred fall on the morrow. Bibo was sitting on an overturned and empty cask close by the gate of the barricade. A small detachment of Citian soldiers was under his command. The work had been very hot lately. Those cursed aristos were becoming terrified and tried their hardest to slip out of Paris. Men, women, and children, whose ancestors, even in remote ages, had served those traitorous bourbons, were all traitors themselves, and right food for the guillotine. Every day, Bobo had had the satisfaction of unmasking some fugitive royalists, and sending them back to be tried by the Committee of Public Safety, presided over by that good patriot, Citoyen Fouquier Tinville. Robespierre and Danton both had commended Bibo for his zeal, and Bibo was proud of the fact that he, on his own initiative, had sent at least fifty aristos to the guillotine. But today all the sergeants in command at the various barricades had had special orders. Recently a very great number of aristos had succeeded in escaping out of France, and in reaching England safely. There were curious rumours about these escapes. They had become very frequent and singularly daring. The people's minds were becoming strangely excited about it all. Surgeon Grospierre had been sent to the guillotine for allowing a whole family of aristos to slip out of the north gate under his very nose. It was asserted that these escapes were organized by a band of Englishmen, whose daring seemed to be unparalleled, and who, from sheer desire to meddle in what did not concern them, spent their spare time in snatching away lawful victims destined for Madame la guillotine. These rumors soon grew in extravagance. There was no doubt that this band of meddlesome Englishmen did exist. Moreover, they seemed to be under the leadership of a man whose pluck and audacity were almost fabulous. Strange stories were afloat of how he and those aristos whom he rescued became suddenly invisible as they reached the barricades and escaped out of the gates by sheer supernatural agency. No one had seen these mysterious Englishmen. As for their leader, he was never spoken of, save with a superstitious shudder. Citoyen Fouquier Tinville would in the course of the day receive a scrap of paper from some mysterious source. Sometimes he would find it in the pocket of his coat. At others it would be handed to him by someone in the crowd whilst he was on his way to the sitting of the Committee of Public Safety. The paper always contained a brief notice that the band of meddlesome Englishmen were at work, and it was always signed with the device drawn in red, a little star-shaped flower, which we in England call the Scarlet Pimpernel. Within a few hours of the receipt of this impudent notice, the citoyens of the Committee of Public Safety would hear, so that, would hear that so many royalists and aristocrats had succeeded in reaching the coast, and were on their way to England and safety. I'm just reading back. Oh, Ardbeck, you're getting into trouble. Um, the guards at the gate had been doubled. The sergeants in command had been threatened with death whilst liberal rewards were offered for the capture of these daring and impudent Englishmen. There was a sum of 5,000 francs promised to the man who, who laid hands on the mysterious and elusive Scarlet Pimpernel. Everyone felt that Bibot would be that man, 
and Bibo allowed that belief to take firm root in everybody's mind. And so, day after day, people came to watch him at the West Gate, so as to be present when he laid hands on any fugitive aristo, who perhaps might be accompanied by that mysterious Englishman. Bah, he said to his trusted corporal, Citoyen Grospier was a fool, had it been me now, at that North Gate last week. Citoyen Bibo spat on the ground to express his contempt for his comrade's stupidity. How did it happen, Citoyen? asked the corporal. Grospier was at the gate, keeping good watch, began Bibo pompously, as the crowd closed in around him, listening eagerly to his narrative. We've all heard of this meddlesome Englishman, this accursed Scarlet Pimpernel. He won't get through my gate, Morbleu, unless he be the devil himself. But Grospier was a fool. The market carts were going through the gates. There was one laden with casks and driven by an old man with a boy beside him. Grospier was a bit drunk, and he thought himself very clever. He looked into the casks, most of them at least, and saw they were empty, and let the cart go through. A murmur of wrath and contempt went round the group of ill-clad wretches who crowded around Citoyen Bibo. Half an hour later, continued the sergeant, up comes the captain of the guard with a squad of some dozen soldiers with him. Has a cat gone through, he asks of Grospier breathlessly. Yes, says Grospier, not half an hour ago. And you have let them escape, shouts the captain furiously. You'll go to the guillotine for this, Citoyen Sergeant. That cart held concealed the ci devant Duc de Chaly and all his family. What? thunders Grospier, aghast. Aye, and the driver was none other than that cursed Englishman, the Scarlet Pimpernel. A howl of execration greeted this tale. Citoyen Grospier had paid for his blunder on the guillotine, but what a fool! Oh, what a fool! Bibot was laughing so much at his own tale that it was some time before he could continue. After them, my men, shouts the captain, he said after a while. Remember the reward. After them, they cannot have gone far. And with that, he rushes through the gate, followed by his dozen soldiers. But it was too late, shouted the crowd excitedly. They never got them. Curse that Grospier for his folly. He deserved his fate. Fancy not examining those casks properly. But these sallies seemed to amuse City and Bibo exceedingly. He laughed until his sides ached and the tears streamed down his cheeks. Nay, nay, he said at last. Those aristos weren't in the cart. The driver was not the Scarlet Pimpernel. What? No, the captain of the guard was that damned Englishman in disguise and every one of his soldiers aristos. The crowd this time said nothing. The story certainly savoured of the supernatural. And though the Republic had abolished God, it had not quite succeeded in killing the fear of the supernatural in the hearts of the people. Truly, that Englishman must be the devil himself. The sun was sinking low down in the west. Bibo prepared himself to close the gates. On avant the carts, he said. Some dozen covered carts were drawn up in a row, ready to leave town, in order to fetch the produce from the country close by, for market the next morning. They were mostly well known to Bibo, as they went through his gate twice every day on their way to and from the town. He spoke to one or two of their drivers, mostly women, and was at great pains to examine the inside of the carts. You never know, he would say and I'm not going to be caught like that fool Grospier. The woman who drove the carts usually spent their day on the Pla, Pla de la Grive, beneath the platform of the guillotine, knitting and gossiping whilst they watched the rows of tumbrils arriving with the victims the reign of terror claimed every day. It was great fun to see the aristos arriving for the reception of Madame la Guillotine, and the places close by the platform were very much sought after. Bibot during the day had been on duty on the place. He recognised most of the old hats, Tricotesis, as they were called, that sounded way more Spanish than French, sorry, who sat there and knitted, whilst head after head fell beneath the knife, and they themselves got quite bespattered with the blood of those cursed aristos. Heh, la mer, said Bibot to one of those horrible hags, what have you got there? He had seen her earlier in the day, with her knitting and the whip of her cart close beside her. Now she had fastened a row of curly locks to the whip handle, all colours from gold to silver, fair to dark, and she stroked them with her huge bunny fingers as she laughed at Bibo. I made friends with Madame Guillotine's lover, she said with a coarse laugh. He cut these off for me from the heads as they rolled down. He has promised me some more tomorrow, but I don't know if I shall be at my usual place. Ah, how is that, Le Mer? said Bibo, who, hard and soldier that he was, could not help shuddering at the awful loathsomeness of the semblance of a woman with her ghastly trophy on the handle of her whip. My grandson has got the smallpox, she said, with a jerk of her thumb towards the inside of her cart. Some say it's the plague. If it is, I shan't be allowed to come into Paris tomorrow. 
At the first mention of the word smallpox, Bibot had stepped hastily backwards, and when the old hag spoke of the plague, he retreated from her as fast as he could. Curse you, he muttered, whilst the whole crowd hastily avoided the cart, leaving it standing all alone in the midst of the place. The old hag laughed. Curse you, Cicerion, for being a coward, she said. Pah! What a man to be afraid of sickness. Morbleu, the plague! Everyone was awestruck and silent, filled with horror for the loathsome malady, the one which still had the power to arise terror and disgust in these savage, brutalized creatures. Get out with you and with your plague-stricken brood, shouted Bibo hoarsely. And with another rough laugh and coarse jest, the old hag whipped up her lean nag and drove her cart out of the gate. This incident had spoiled the afternoon. The people were terrified of these two horrible curses, the two maladies which nothing could cure, and which were the precursors of an awful and lonely death. They hung about the barricade, silent and sullen for a while, eyeing one another suspiciously, avoiding each other as if by instinct, lest the plague lurked already in their midst. Presently, as in the case of Grospier, a captain of the guard appeared suddenly, but he was known to be Beau, and there was no fear of his turning out to be a sly Englishman in disguise. A cart, he shouted breathlessly, even before he had reached the gates. What cart? asked Bibot roughly. Driven by an old hag, a covered cart. There were a dozen. An old hag who said her son had the plague. Yes, you have not let them go. More blow, said Bibot, whose purple cheeks had suddenly become white with fear. The cart contained the ci-devant Comtesse de Tournay and her two children, all of them traitors and condemned to death. And their driver, muttered Bibot as a superstitious shudder ran down his spine. Sacre tonnerre, said the captain, but it is feared that it was that, ac that accursed Englishman himself, the Scarlet Pimpernel. That's the end of chapter one. <coughs> okay. I'm going to go back and read all the things you guys wrote while I was reading. Please refrain from spamming caps. Told off by Streamlabs. <laughs> Swears all good. Hi, Liliana. Liliana Catriona. That's an excellent name. I hope I do it justice. I've never read it before, and like I said, my French is awful. So I'm probably pronouncing things wrong, but hopefully I'm doing it justice. It's great fun so far. It's, it's so um, flamboyant. <laughs> 100% pronouncing things wrong? Damn right. <laughs> or 100% doing it justice. Why not both? Both of the things. Drumming in the... <laughs> Were you drumming on the, on the, on the screen? What was that? I said, were you drumming on the screen? No, I was drumming here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, well. I speak a lot of languages. French is not one of them. Sorry. So I'm going to pronounce it like it's Spanish because it looks like Spanish. And I speak a little Spanish. Yes, I'm drinking orange Prussian. It's not the same orange Prussian, but it's orange Prussian. Nonetheless. So those of you who speak French are just going to have to deal with the fact that I don't. Sorry about that. Um, nice to have you back, Artbeck. Where have you been? Have you been off doing like important life stuff, like being a dad and running a business? Instead of listening to me where you should be, making brisket. <laughs> overreactive quarantine. Yeah, we're in overreactive quarantine too. But we, I overreacted yes. myself. Yeah, because I am coughing and I don't want to be judged by everyone at work, so I work from home. And I can work from home, so why not, right? I'm good with that. The introvert in me is quite happy with the idea, I'm not going to lie. Mm. I'm all sparkly. What? <laughs> <laughs> Got a mind, a head cold, and everyone lost their minds. 
Yeah, well. You can highlight the message with uh, channel points. Yes. It's not really sparkly, though. Well, <laughs> it's just extremely purple. It doesn't quite have the same ring to it, though, does it? I'm no. extremely purple! It just makes it sound like you're helping my breath to do it. <laughs> uh, I mean, we have um, tier subscriber tier e emotes now as well. But I think that I can. Oh, you might be able to use them if you're logged in as fourth mood. No, it says that locked. Oh, well, I can use them. Look. I will show you them because I think they're great. That's uh, because I'm in first uh, spiral. Yeah. That's my favorite. It's an ass cactus. So anyone who's subscribed should be able to make the ass cactus. And then if you're at a higher tier, there will be others. There's currently a B, and there's going to be a duck when I get around to actually uploading it. It exists, I just haven't put it in yet. So. That's pretty cool. I like the Ask Cactus though, because it means that when people show up and act like dicks, we can Ask Cactus them. <laughs> no perdishes today. I don't know where he is. Stuck at school, maybe. Well, I read you a chapter. I am going to go and do other things now. But I'll be back tomorrow, and every day after that, that is a weekday, to read the rest. And once we finish this one, well, when we get to like probably about halfway through, we'll vote for the next one so that I can actually get it from Book Depository if there's one that I don't really have. Ooh! Oh, those pistoly ones. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, that's it. You all take care of yourselves. Art Big, wash your damn hands. <laughs> What the hell is that? This is like a stinky cheese. Is that what it is? Um, wash your hands, take care of yourselves, and have an excellent afternoon. And I love you all for being here. Come back tomorrow. <laughs>